The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Chris, welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, mate. Great to have you on. Yeah, good to chat again, Alan. Yeah, we caught up in Melbourne, I think it was last week, when you were down with Joseph, which was great, um, following the release of the 2022 um, ETF report from Stockspot, which is great. It's really informative, lots of good charts. Uh, I'll put links in the show notes for folks that are listening. And... um, I thought maybe what we could do on the back of that is really just reflect on how the last 12 months has been, not just for the ETF industry in general, but what you've seen from Stockspot users on clients. And then maybe we can talk about everything from like flows, how where the kind of value is accruing in the ETF industry and how maybe Australia compares to global markets. So maybe a good place to start is kind of like what have we seen over the past 12 months from the ETF industry here in Australia? Well, broadly, I mean, the ETF industry consistently grows pretty fast and and, and we've seen that again over the last year. Now, the last six months have been pretty difficult in all sorts of markets and and certainly Mm -hmm. over the last few months, ETFs have taken a hit in terms of the assets they're managing and and the performance of different, um, you know, asset classes. But Look, as ETFs have been growing at you know forty or fifty percent a year pretty consistently over the last five or six years. Um, you know, since I started following them, and we did our first ETF research report, really when ETFs weren't that well known in Australia eight years ago. You know, at that point, ETFs only had about thirteen billion under management in Australia, which you know at the time it shocked me because I thought they were such a wonderful product and more people should be aware mm. of them. That's now one hundred and thirty billion, so it's ten times over that eight years. Um, which is pretty phenomenal growth compared to just asset management generally in Australia, like other areas like managed funds and listed investment companies have only grown at a fraction of that rate. And and so it's been a constant trend. I think as more 
people become educated and, you know, businesses like yours are doing a lot of the heavy lifting on education as well, um, you know, just around the evidence behind index investing in ETFs. You know, I, I think the internet's making it more and more clear to people um, that these are wonderful products for long-term investors. Mm, there are over, what, 240 ETFs now across the CBOE and ASX. Um, just from reading from your report here, um, $135 billion in funds under management. And it's, like you said, it's pretty impressive growth. How does this stack up compared to, say, the United States or Europe? Or Do we have any context around maybe how big this can get or um, how we're faring relative to those markets? Well, it's interesting. Our growth is now faster than a lot of those markets. So the US and, and, and Europe, and um, a lot of that is due to the fact that we're behind them. So the US and, and Europe and, and North America generally had rapid growth in ETFs, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. They were well ahead of us. and um, But now they've started to grow just because ETFs and indexing are a much larger portion of their market. So I think indexing broadly across unlisted and listed products is around 50% of their market now. Um, and, and ETFs over there are about 23% of their market. Um, here they're much smaller. Um, you know, they're, they're well under 10% still here. Um, and, and so there's a long way to go. But that growth is, is, is sort of heading heading in the right direction. So eight years ago, again, when we started this report, ETFs only made up um, about 1% of the in investable asset market outside of super. Um, you know, now uh, it, it's about 4%. So relative to other investments, it's growing very fast, but I, th I still think there's a long way to go in Australia. I, you know, the one of the big encumbrances I thought was the the challenge with advisors not recommending ETFs ahead of the Royal Commission in Australia. You know, I had identified that as one of the reasons why yeah. ETFs weren't growing was just no one was recommending them. Everyone was recommending products that they'd get commissions from. You know, you get a commission when you sell a listed investment company or a hybrid or a lot of other products. So brokers and advisors just weren't motivated um, unless they were fee-for-service or unless they had a different model. But um, yeah, it's great. Since the Royal Commission, a lot of that's changing. You know, a lot more advisors are, are using and recommending ETFs, um, as well as, yeah, self-directed investors who might have been picking um, stocks in the past. Mm. How about, so one of the things, Chris, that kind of, I guess, picks up the back of the hairs on the back of the neck for some investors when they hear, oh, ETFs are 23% of the, the US market. They think like, oh, there's some systemic risks. I think... Um, the uh, the guy from is it Michael Burry from the Big Short? I think it was came out and said there's like a bubble or it could cause a bubble and there are some issues. How do you read into that? Um, and maybe maybe it's actually worth maybe just saying what what the fear is as well. Maybe just acknowledging that. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the fear sort of makes some sort of lo logical sense to people that if ETFs and indexing become so big, they become the market, and therefore mm -hmm. the fear is that markets will become inefficient and. You know, prices will go crazy and money will only go into indices and nowhere else. Um, it, it, it doesn't, if you actually kind of look into the facts and, and, and I mean, this is a fear that's not new as well. Like I've seen it for the mm. last eight years since I started my business. It, it's usually a fear perpetuated by active fund managers. And if you have a look at the articles and you occasionally see them on, on Bloomberg and, and the FT and you look at the author, it's almost always someone that, um, you know, ha has something to gain from uh, fear mongering <laughs> would be my first point. But but actually, logically, it doesn't make a lot of sense because even in the US now, where indexing and ETFs make up 50% uh, of the overall assets, they still only make up less than 5% of the trading. And trading is what's important because it's that buying and selling that leads to price discovery. And the price discovery is what makes the market efficient. So 95% mm. of the trading is still happening uh, between fund managers and professionals trying to decide on what are the right prices of shares. And, you know, like we see in Australia, in, in, it's not like every share goes up and down the same amount. Um, you know, BHP and Telstra are moving in a different direction. You know, CSL is moving in a different direction. That that price discovery um, is working perfectly in Australia and, and the US. And if it wasn't, um, active fund managers would have it much easier at actually making a crust and mm. actually in the market. And so the best um, reason I, I would always say to people of why um, ETFs can't possibly be making the market inefficient is if those efficiencies, inefficiencies existed, someone would be able to exploit them and make money from them. And that's simply not happening. So a lot of the real academic research into this says that until ETFs and indexing are more than 90% of a market, uh, markets will continue to operate e efficiently. And the best thing about markets is if they're not efficient, someone will get in there and arbitrage mm. to actually make money from that inefficiency. And so 
Um, no, it's it, it's not something that people should worry about. That ETFs are, are suddenly going to make the market inefficient, or or they're going to crash. ETFs really are just a much more efficient way for investors to get access to the same underlying investments that they were buying historically through active fund managers anyway. So if you think mm -hmm. about it, it's the same underlying shares you're buying in an ETF than you would have, you know, 20 years ago if you gave your money to Colonial or BT. Um, it's just that you're only paying 10 basis points for it rather than 1.5%. So when you're earning 10% a year in the share market, rather than you giving away 15% of that, you can give away a lot less. Uh, you mentioned there that you know, the academic research suggests around 90%. Um, and it's actually just one quick point is that you said, you know, it, if the markets were inefficient in price discovery, someone would exploit it. And um, there are ETFs that aren't just vanilla, you know, market cap weighted, in, like following market cap weighted indices these days. So even an ETF could come out to challenge other ETFs in that price discovery. So it's very much possible that, you know, there is no major issue here. Um, you mentioned there that, you know, academic research suggests maybe even 90% could be in index funds um, or ETFs before it becomes an issue. And you said that 50% is what the level is, or just over 50%, I think, in the United States. How much do you think could be invested in ETFs or index funds um, as a percentage of the pie? I mean, I, th I think over the next 20 years, they'll probably reach some sort of equilibrium where... Um, and, and it will be a, a combination of ETFs growing, but also active fund manager fees going down where on average, mm. you know, more than 50% of active fund managers then can beat the market. And at that point, active funds management becomes more appealing as an investor. It's always appealing if you're an active fund manager. It's a great industry to be in. But right now as an investor, it doesn't make a lot of sense when, um, and we've recently shown the stats, it was 76% of um, fund managers in Australia, investing in large cap Australian shares underperformed just the Vanguard Australian Shares Index. It was 66% in the small cap area, and it was 97% in the global large cap area. So until those right. those figures shift around and actually um, show that as an investor, you're better off investing in an active fund, ETFs will continue to grow and indexing relative to active. Um, where is that equilibrium? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. We're, we're clearly not there yet. And it will depend on how fast active fund manager fees come down. And I think that's something that's obviously happening at the moment as well is if you have a look at the share prices of some active fund managers in Australia, I think investors are realising that there's a secular problem there. It's not just a cyclical thing that they're underperforming, but in a, on a secular, secular basis, active fund managers need to drastically reduce their fees to have any shot at beating the market over the long run. And so mm. I can imagine over the next 20 years, yeah, we will reach a point where um, investors or rational investors should be more indifferent between the two of them. Um, but really cost is the big factor. Do you think or do you see this, even if it's anecdotally when speaking to clients, that um, more people are adopting uh, the core and satellite approach to portfolio construction and using the, the core of their portfolio purely as passive? Some, I, th I think, uh, uh, you know, when markets are, are hot, like in 2020 or the second half of 2020 and mm. 2021, unfortunately, people without, uh, you know, the, the experience of a lot of market cycles almost take the opposite approach where they put the majority of their money in these satellites and, and then a small mm. amount in the core. And it's usually only when there's a big market correction like we're having at the moment where people realize that that may not have been a sensible strategy. Um yeah, I think for people that still want to have some sort of say on their, on their investments, a core satellite approach makes sense. We offer something similar for stock spot investors where they can actually allocate 20% of their portfolio to, um, you know, particular, um, you know, countries or areas of the market that they want. I still think you need to be a bit careful on that satellite approach because the temptation is always to chase things that a lot of people are talking about, that you're reading in the news, that are hot. You know, we see it in the ETF world that the ETFs that are launching are typically those ones that, they're already at peak exuberance in terms of retail excitement in that particular area. And so, you know, my, my, um, my experience would tell me that although the satellite, you know, core approach is uh, appealing, that actually you're probably going to be no better off than simply putting your money in a, a diversified mix of index funds. Um, you know, you're going to feel a bit more control and maybe that's something more people want, but actually your chances of earning a better return are not that high. Mm. Uh, Chris, there's a, particular chart and I'm probably just catching you off guard unless you've got it in front of you but um, there's a particular chart from your report which shows how the I guess the value 
or like how much of the pie goes to the issuer of an ETF versus the um, investor themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can remember it, but um, I've got it here in front of me. And I was actually surprised to see that you've, you guys have measured the, like the gross return from all of the ETF providers. And you've said how much as a percentage of that gross return goes to the ETF issuer versus the, the, the end investor. And I was surprised that Perth Mint with their PM Gold ETF was in number one. It collects very little of the kind of the creation, the wealth creation there versus the the value or the gross share overall. And then you've got uh, Spider after that, then Vanguard, iShares, Vanek. And right at the other end, um, we've got funds like Montgomery, K2, Loftus Peak, um, the more active funds. Were you surprised where any of those fell? Not really. I mean, you would expect that the purely indexed low cost ones will be on the left. I think Perth Mint's probably on the very left, left for one particular reason, which is that, um, you know, it, it's basically one ETF. Um, and yeah. that one ETF um, gold um, has done pretty well over the last five years. Um, and so um, as an issuer, it doesn't have some ETFs that have done well and some that have done badly. It just has one that's done pretty well and its fees are relatively low on that ETF. So if you look at five years of gold performance in Australia, and I, I don't know the number on the top of my head, but it's something like 10% per year return um, and, and uh, you know, a fee that's well under half a percent per year, then you've got a, a pretty attractive um, proposition. Um, yeah, on the other side, like you mentioned, it's the active fund managers and, and it's a message that we're always trying to explain to investors that if you are investing with active fund managers, it's a great industry to be in as the active fund manager because of the overall pie of returns, um, you're taking a big share of them yourself. Um, but as the investor that's actually providing the capital to them, um, it's a terrible mm-hmm. outcome because you've you've taken all the risk, you've provided all the capital you've got all the downside if it doesn't work out and yet you're getting a very small part of the overall return. So, you know, mm. that, that sort of adds more weight to the, what I just mentioned before around active fund managers needing to charge less. At the moment, it, the, um, you know, the, the reward versus risk ratio for an investor in an active fund is horribly skewed against the investor um, and, and it really needs to go back in the other direction to make any sense. Um, uh, when you're in Melbourne, I showed you because uh, one of the ETFs that feature... Uh, in your report and you talk about thematic ETFs. There's actually a really good blog on your website. Um, I'm not sure if you wrote it or someone in your team did about uh, thematic ETFs and how they underperform and you reference some um, literature on this, which I've since read and it's really interesting. Um, and thematic ETFs have this terrible ability to play the hype, launch the ETF right at peak hype for you know maximum farm on day one and then just fall away. Um, and in particular, when you're in Melbourne, um, I showed you this. There's almost a way to track this when you look at like Google search interest. You can use Google Trends to see what's popular in the ETF space. And um, the, the BetaShares Crip ETF was so popular. It was more popular than almost every ETF, um, regardless of size, besides, say, I think it was the Vanguard VAS ETF. Um, maybe we can just pay some lip service to this. Um, why do thematic ETFs so badly underperform typically? I mean, I think you've touched on it really, which is the timing of when they launch. So you've got to put yourself in the shoes of an ETF issuer. When they launch a new product, they want to have confidence that it's going to grow enough to actually sustain the product. And so there's enough interest in it. And a lot of the big broad indices now are already highly competitive. There's already a lot of assets in them. It's very hard to break into, you know, an ASX 200 ETF. And so the issuers tend to follow trends. What, you know, what are people searching? What assets are doing well? Um, and, And they know that it, retail investors tend to chase performance. You know, that they'll they'll end up buying technology after technology's done well for five years, or they'll buy lithium stocks after they've done well for three years, or they'll, and, and so mm-hmm. ETF issuers, um, you know, if, if their motivation is to acquire assets and to earn some money on those assets, they'll look for those areas where they think there's already a lot of interest to launch products. Um, and, you know, and, and, and by that reasoning, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a recession ETF coming out quite soon. But it really is what ETF <laughs> issuers are doing. They're looking at what people are searching and, and creating products around them. Unfortunately, though, in markets, as, as, as you know, there's a level of mean reversion and things that do well for a while end up not usually doing well for a period as well. And, and it just happens. And it's not just in ETFs. It's in all sorts of products. And I think in, in probably that blog that you're referring to, I... I look back in 99, 2000, and it was the years that there was a whole bunch of big technology funds launching. Now, back then, it wasn't usually ETFs. I mean, ETFs didn't really exist in Australia back then. It was just managed funds. 
but all of the big um, big active fund managers at that point in time, you know, BT, AMP, they're all launching these technology managed funds. And so uh, it's it's not really something that's unique to ETFs. It's just more unique to human psychology more broadly as people love to chase what's interesting and hot and getting mentioned and and has made people money in the in the past and ETFs um, are, are no different so it's something we try and warn people about in our in our research this year is that even though ETFs in Australia made 10 people 10 billion dollars over the last year and granted that's to the end of March it's probably a, a fair bit less um, a few months after that mm. um, the Matic ETFs that launched in that period actually lost investors $100 million. And so yeah. it really shows the divide between, well, are you investing or are you speculating? If you're investing, you've got a pretty good chance of making money. If you're speculating, you've got a pretty good chance of losing money. You know, you don't get the dopamine hit from investing, but you certainly are probably going to be better off, um, you know, from a financial perspective. It's interesting too. There's a number in uh, two numbers that you quoted in your report, which was that, um, thematic or sector ETFs and active ETFs only accounted for thematic was 11% and active was 6% of the flows into ETFs. So it's actually, I mean, it's, I guess it's not that surprising, but it's probably a lot smaller than what people realized. Um, like the people are still like dollar cost averaging and just trickling money into the core diversified funds, right? Yeah, I mean, these, these thematic ETFs are growing relatively fast. Um, you know, there's a lot of marketing that's getting behind mm. them and um, Fair point. But the, the challenge that they have is, you know, they can attract the assets, but then it's hard to retain them. If, if, you, if your ETF's falling 50% or there's some thematic ETFs that have fallen 80%, one, your assets are already mm. shrinking, and two, not many people that have lost 80% want to stick around to see what's, uh, what's coming up in the future. So um, thematic ETFs would have much higher churn and, and much lower uh, retention of, of money, whereas, yeah, these broad ones – they're really conducive to just investing gradually over the long run, like you say, dollar cost averaging. So actually, yeah, well, it's an interesting stat again in the report is that oh, while the majority of new ETFs launched over the last year are these active or thematic ETFs, the majority of money is actually still going into these um, broad diversified ETFs, which I actually think is great. Mm. You know, I'd be very concerned if the majority of money was going into these these newly launched ETFs. Oh, for sure. Um so what would you say, if I could ask this to you, what was probably the best and the worst ETF of the past year? I mean, the, the best However ETF... you want to slice that up. Yeah, I mean, the best ETFs over the last year have been, um, interestingly, all the oil and fuel ETFs. So I think there's one that the code is fuel and another one that the um, code is OOO, um, simply mm. because oil price was one of the few assets that has actually risen over the last year. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of these ETFs, even though they've done great over the last year and, and mainly due to the product structure. So the oil ETF, um, because you can't really buy physical oil like you can buy physical gold and store it somewhere, you know, barrels of oil are very big and you can't really just buy a ship and, you know, push it out to sea with thousands of barrels of oil on it. So oil ETFs, rather than buying physical oil, they roll futures contracts. And this is a very mm. expensive process and quite a risky process as well. Um, and, and if you actually look at the performance of the oil ETF against the oil price, it's enormously underperformed over the long run. So even if you are an investor that is really bullish on the oil price, um, it may not actually be an appropriate product for you because it doesn't actually give you a return that reflects the underlying oil price. Um, so they were the, some of the, the, um, the best performers. Mm -hmm. The worst performers this year were Interestingly, some of the better performers of previous years. So a lot of the ETFs in the technology sector, you know, some of the um, you know, Chinese and Asian technology focused um, ETFs. These were the heavily marketed ETFs of a year and two years ago. And I remember going to conferences a few years ago and a lot of the ETF issuers had all their banners up for these these newly launched, um, you know, Asian technology tiger ETFs. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if your uh, listeners and, and viewers want a a strategy of, of working out which ETFs to avoid, I'd, I'd be going to these conferences and having a look <laughs> at the ones that the ETF manufacturers are promoting most heavily. <laughs> yeah, it's the counterpoint, right? Like when you go to the conference, you go to the rooms where no one is. Um, it's probably the better strategy. Yeah, you should be asking them, what is the ETF that no one's asking you about today? What's the one that's not seeing any flows over the last 12 months? And maybe it's the it's a bit a bit too contrarian but i think yeah the point is that if there's a lot of excitement and, and they're marketing something heavily uh yeah run in the other direction 
Do you use any active ETFs or thematic ETFs in your portfolios? No. So, I mean, in our core portfolio, we just give broad exposure to the big global markets and asset classes. So we have an Australian shares ETF, um, a, a global large cap shares ETF, an emerging markets ETF, uh, government bonds and gold ETF. Um, so these are all just broad, in index-based, uh, market cap-based um, ETFs. Then we give clients a, a selection of, I think it's 20 or 25 different, we call them themes, but actually they're still quite broad asset class-based ETFs. Um, and, and they're they're only specific as um, a sector, and we've chosen a few sectors that are slightly underweight in our market relative to the global market, where sometimes you know people yeah. might want a little bit more exposure. Um, but yeah, we limit the exposure in these ETFs to six percent of your portfolio, so relatively low, and probably lower than you know some people would imagine mm-hmm. for a satellite. Um, you know, because the risk is that you know, unlike the broad indices, which aren't going to fall eighty percent or go to zero. Some of, uh, some of these other sectors can be extremely volatile. And, and so you can't really afford mm. to have a big portion of your portfolio in them if you want to be able to sleep at night. We've, we've talked in the past about gold and there are two, uh, three like primary gold ETFs that people probably know of on the ASX. There's the PM Gold ETF, which is from uh, Perth Mint. Then there's the Gold ETF, GOLD from ETF Securities. And then there's the QAU ETF, which is hedged into Aussie dollars, one from beta shares. Um, do you use any, do you use, which of these three do you use if you use them? Yeah. So we've used the, the GOLD, um, just the gold, um, ETF since 2014 when we launched. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately they're all good products. You know, we prefer first of all, for it to be unhedged. So to be Australian dollars gold and, and I've, I've written some blogs on that in the past, but the reason is as an Australian investor, what you're actually trying to protect against is a devaluation in our currency, the Aussie dollar. Um, whereas if you own gold in US dollars, it really only protects against a US dollar, um, you know, fall. And so if you're protect, trying to protect against a recession in Australia or central banks needing to print a lot of money here to bail out our country, you really want to have the denominator of your gold ETF being Aussie dollars. Um, and it's been the right strategy since, you know, since we started, um, the Aussie dollar has fallen. So that mm-hmm. Aussie dollar denominated ETFs done better. And actually, you know, this is another great example of ETFs being launched at the peak, um, that that beta shares gold ETF actually got launched very close to the peak in the Aussie dollar. Um, I think it was around right. 2011. And so at the time, it seemed like a great idea to have US, um, yeah, US denominated gold, but actually ever since for the last 12 years, it, it hasn't been. Um, so mm-hmm. the other two products are, are good as well, like the, um, the PM gold product, as we talked about earlier on the show, it, it charges very low fees. Um, There are a few small, um, quite technical differences between the products. Mm. I think gold is stored in Singapore from memory, whereas our gold is stored um, in a vault in London. Um, But, uh, yeah, ultimately a good product as well. Um, And the the US dollar beta shares one is also a good product if you want your gold denominated in, in, in that currency. Mm. Yeah, they're very, um, I guess people are going to be looking back over the last five years now and, and seeing the performance of them and thinking, well, you know, I would have loved to have had gold in, in my portfolio, it seems. Um, how about traditionally asset classes, you know, are divided by basically stocks and bonds, right? And we, we've we seen over the past six to 12 months, some of the big bond ETFs really come under like heat. We've got the VAF ETF, which is the Vanguard Aussie fixed interest, the international fixed interest from Vanguard, the IAF ETF from iShares. Like all these have been under pressure. Um, what, what do you make of the defensive role of the bond ETFs? Well, you're right. Traditionally, people expect that when share markets fall, bonds are like the protection in your portfolio and it's what everyone sort yeah. of learns. That's why you have a 60-40 portfolio to, to protect. Mm. This year, the 40 has gone down as much as the 60 and if in some cases, even more. So, mm. you know, Australian shares were down 10% or so in the 22 financial year. Bonds were down about the same. Um, and that's high-grade mm. government bonds. If you look at uh, lower quality bonds, you know, corporate bonds, junk bonds, emerging market bonds, they fell a lot more. I think emerging market bonds were down 23% since the start of this year. Um, yeah, and, right. and so I think people need to be aware with bonds that just because it earns a higher return doesn't mean it's a better bond. Actually, a higher return means it's a riskier bond. And in a scenario like this year, you know, a riskier bond can fall by a lot and actually move in a similar direction to shares. Um, 
But this year hasn't been a- around that as much as interest rates driving bonds down, as interest rate expectations have been rising pretty rapidly. And now we're expecting or the, you know, the market's expecting interest rates of over 3% mm. in Australia in a year's time. That's really what's driven the bond sell-off. But it's been those same factors that have made bond sell-off that have been factors that have been considered in share markets to be negative. So, you know, pressure on households to pay their mortgages, you know, um, you know all of the, the inflation um, problems we're seeing around energy prices rising. Um, so, yeah, this year it's been an an anomaly. Um, does it mean that bonds won't work in the future? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, um, you know, one year doesn't doesn't mean that bonds aren't defensive. Um, and actually, they're defensive over the long run. No, no one ever promises bonds are defensive on a one day time horizon or a or a one yeah. month or one year time horizon. Um, however, I, I do agree with with your point though that um, I think it's going to highlight to people the need for other defensive assets in your portfolio. And a lot of um, assets that were considered defensive have, have fallen pretty badly this year. You know, hybrids is a good example. Property is a good example. And just because something's unlisted doesn't mean it doesn't fall. It just means it's slower to get marked to market, but it's it's not mm-hmm. immune to the same market forces. So if your super fund is telling you, oh, don't worry, ours is unlisted, uh, <laughs> that's a load of rubbish because <laughs> unlisted assets fall in value too. You might not see it as quickly, but they're going to fall. Um, you know, gold is one where up over the last year it's up 5% when bonds are down 10%. Um, I, I think it's going to highlight to people, um, yeah, the need for some of these other, um, you know, defensive type assets, and there's not too many of those out there. Are there any uh, ETFs, Chris, I should probably know this off the top of my head, that um, have like floating rate notes or anything like that, in like inflation linked or protected? Yeah, there is. So there are infl- inflation linked um, bond ETFs um, that have done leave a little bit better than the uh, regular ones this year because inflation has been one of the you know causes for bonds to fall. Um, it doesn't mean that they've gone up. I think they've fallen by less. Um, there are also, yeah, rather than fixed um, uh, rates, like, um, you know, the, the typical Australian government bond ETF, there are also floating um, bonds as well, as well as cash ETFs. So, you know, that's something that's interesting over the last few months. The cash ETF, which was paying next to nothing, is now paying 1% in Australia. And it will be paying a mm. lot more, I imagine, over the next few months as the RBA increases interest rates. Mm. So um, ha- have you, I guess, had to do any type of rebalancing to your models then given the performance of bond versus gold versus Aussie global stocks? Like have you done any kind of like tactical so we have- changes or anything like that? Yeah, we, we over eight years, we've only made two changes in the strategic asset allocations in our portfolios, which is essentially hmm. the percentages in the different assets. Um, in 2017, we actually increased the bond allocation, which worked quite well in the, in the crisis in 2020. And then in 2021, we actually reduced our bond allocation um, and, and allocated some of it to gold and some of it to emerging market shares. Um, now, gold's done very well. Emerging market shares have not done so well. And so it's been a bit of a mixed bag so far. But, um, yeah, we, we're probably a bit unusual. If you look at a lot of um, diversified funds out there, um, I, I have yet to see any that has a, a allocation anywhere near ours to gold. Ours is 14.8%. Um, but it's been proven to really uh, reduce the, the bumps in people's portfolios and improve the quality of returns. And, and, and um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to continue to see that going forward. So... Yeah, we, we got a lot of questions in the early years. I remember when gold wasn't doing as mm. well, 2014 and 2015. You know, a lot of people were emailing us saying, hey, can you please sell all of the gold in my portfolio? I don't want it. Now we're getting the opposite questions. We're getting emails through, hey, can you put more money <laughs> in gold, please? I don't want to have any of these government bonds or shares, just uh, more gold. And whenever we get these questions, we have to explain that, you know, even though gold's doing well in this environment, you still need a diversified mix because, um, it, it doesn't mean that gold's going to do well next year. Maybe it's shares that do well next year. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Um, how about then, just before we wrap up, mate, um, What I guess this is more of a question, not just for the ETF landscape, not just for stocks, but just generally from the financial services sector, is what do you expect to see from like our market going forward over the next, say, three to five years? Obviously, being a fintech in wealth management, um, you're at the pointy end of it, like innovation for our sector. What do you expect to see in the way maybe we go to market, the way investors interact, the the mix? I think you're you're going to say, you know, we'll see more flows into passive and ETFs. What other things are you seeing that are coming across your desk and you think that's really interesting? 
Well, I mean, yeah, the, the ETF trends are uh, probably, a, for listeners, a bit of a given what we've discussed before. Like, I certainly think whenever there's a market downturn, it's a great thing for indexing and ETFs because all of those people that were actively trading, you know, picking stocks, mm. giving the money to fund managers, um, you know, markets falling and corrections are a humbling moment where you realize maybe you didn't know everything that you thought mm. you did. And actually, for a lot of people, it gives them that aha moment where they realize, actually, maybe I should be more hands off. You know, maybe ETFs and indexing aren't so bad after all. Um, and and mm-hmm. so you see a lot of the big growth spurts in, in ETFs and indexing happen after market crises. And it, I, to me, it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a market share thing where you've got all of these, um, you know, trading products that have emerged, let's say, over the last few years. And, and they were popular for a couple of years. But it's quite possible that our market won't be a great market for day trading for the next five or 10 years. And, and so all of those people that have set up trading accounts um, I, I think are likely to shut them over the next couple of years. And if they still want to grow their wealth by investing, they'll probably find other options. Um, so that's, I mean, that's something I would expect to see. And you see it after every market cycle, you know, at the end of 2007, eight or, or 2000, 2001, there's a whole bunch of new investors that join the market and get very excited because there's high returns on offer. Then they lose a lot mm. of money and they go through a bit of a realization process. And then the next time they come to invest, they're not going to take that speculative approach. They've wisened up and they take a more sensible approach. So I would expect that to happen again, again in the next cycle. Um, look, a, a, apart from that, I, I mean, I, I think um, online generally is just a, a, a great place, a great leveler for all investors. Um, you know, in the, in the past, sophisticated investors had a lot more access to information. Mm. And, and, and these days, everyone has basically equal access to information at the same point in time. Um, so it's it's a great level. I'd, does it make it easier to beat the market? No, it actually makes it harder yeah. because now you've got millions of people in the world accessing the same information at the same time, trying to make decisions. Um, but I think also it will it will continue to help with education, like what your business does. Um, you know that there's so many um, people you know trying to learn how to grow their wealth by investing. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of them will come online for the answers, and, and there'll be a whole bunch of mm. new products and services trying to trying to help guide people. Yeah, for sure. I think I also think like the the way um, more investors are accessing the market is different these days. Um, not you know it's not the majority, but many investors maybe don't have brokerage accounts. Maybe they set up you know these like like a stock spot account, or they set up you know a diversified portfolio in a way that's really low touch. Right? It's just like autopilot for them. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think I mean there's certainly common. people that are really interested in in learning about markets from a hobby perspective and and want to get that detail and, and be very active in how they approach it. And yeah, that's one group of people, but there are so many out there that are just too busy. I mean, they've got their jobs, their families, they want to be traveling, like investing isn't mm. something that they want to be doing actively as a hobby, but they realize that, you know, over the long run, if they do have some savings to, um, to grow, it does make some sense not to have it all just in a bank account. And I mean, that was the inspiration mm. for, for starting my business was, you know, I had lots of friends at um, uni and, and, and my partner who weren't in finance and so were too timid to actually tip their money into the market, would leave it all in a 9G savings account where um, it wasn't money they planned to use for the next 10 years. So, you know, really if there was a sensible way for them to invest, invest, it, it's probably quite a good option. So, but I think going back to your first question as well, the advice landscape is massively changing in Australia. We've seen a mm. reduction in the number of, of advice out there and, and that's, you know, traditionally where people have gone to learn about um, investing or, or get access to market. So there will be need to be more, um, you know, products and services that kind of fill that need and particularly for smaller investors where, you know, these days you need at least half a million dollars or a million dollars to see an, an advisor and that number's going up. Um, you know, that's only maybe 10 or, you know, definitely less than 20%, probably more than more like 5 or 10% of the market. So what's going to happen for the rest of the people out there? They, they also, um, you know, need help and guidance. Mm. But there's no way they can be serviced by a you know a human advisor charging five thousand dollars a year. So there needs to be other options. Mm, yeah, it's um, it's yeah, it's it's a pretty like it's a scary thought for a lot of um folks that maybe are earlier in their journey don't have that asset pool or just don't have that kind of that wealth. But at the same time, that creates opportunity for businesses like mine and like yours um, to come in and fill that gap as well. So that's where innovation and things like that get really exciting and there's a really uh, big opportunity there for us. So Chris Baraki from uh, founder of Stockspot, mate, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me again on the show. Yeah, it's always good to chat.
Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.